We good? Manny, can everybody see it? You got it. You got okay, it. Very good. Um, good. One thing I did forget to mention is that this meeting is a trial for tonight because we didn't know how well it was going to go. And so this is probably why you hadn't seen it on our Facebook page, the website, or announced in the nugget because we don't want to fall flat on our faces and invite a lot of people to come to it and then they're not going to come next program. So a little bit of a due diligence on our part here just to make sure we got our ducks in a row. But uh, everything seems to be going okay. And so um, this being the test bed, we'll probably open it up to the general public uh, for our next Zoom meeting and make an announcement in the nugget for our program, whatever that might be. So without further ado, tonight's program, I had delivered this uh, in 2016 um, or early 2017. So it hasn't been that long ago, but we never recorded it. And I added a few slides and did, did a little bit more research on this. So it's an unknown or little known um, aspect about mining in Lumpkin County. And that was dealing with copper. But why copper? My thing is slow, why isn't it advancing? Hit the arrow thing. That's what I'm doing. You locked up? No. Let's stop screen sharing and for a second here and go back and open her back up again, see what happens. I see it. It's always like this. It works perfect in practice, yep. but in real situation, there's always a problem. Open up uh, Outlook. There you go. Okay. Start the slideshow. Yeah, right there. All right, here we go. Minor there we go. The program. All right, so. In about the early 1850s, there seemed to be a copper boom that started in Lumpkin County. Don't know really what started this. Maybe it had to do with the fact that a lot of the miners that had been looking for gold had gone to California. And so there was new properties that were being uh, prospected looking for more gold. And all of a sudden they came upon this. Um, the bad thing is we've got some newspaper accounts, but these are all not local ones. They're re they were reprinted from the Dahlonega paper or the Lumpkin County papers uh, in other state newspapers. So some of our uh, accounts, they're kind of scant and few between here. But um, going back to why would copper have been important to mine at this time in history in the 1850s, uh, we knew that it was a thermal conductor, electrical conductor, it was corrosion resistant, easily joined, ductile, tough, non-magnetic or non-ferrous, attractive in color and easy to alloy. And you get different alloys of copper. If you know anything about doing this, if you add copper with zinc, you'll get brass and copper to tin, you'll get bronze. So it did make it a valuable uh, precious metal to mine, not as much as gold, obviously, but in paying quantities, it would be uh, worth pursuing. And this is just other different uses of copper 
within the United States at that time. Um, wooden sailing vessels sheathing. That was in the bottom of a lot of wooden sailing vessels. They would put copper plates or copper sheets in there in order to make them cut through the water faster. I didn't know that, but that was kind of interesting. So that would have been for the shipping industry. Copper had a big use right there. And then of course we have our special uses in Appalachia for copper, for doing moonshining. Um, some of the things that we didn't know about that we kind of learned along the way was that I had always asked myself, how did people know, you know, what to look for if they were looking for gold? I mean, obviously, you know, over time, it was kind of a tried and true method, but how would you know that there was copper or in some cases, just any type of um, mineral ore bearing body somewhere in the area? And when we had started going out in some of these spots that we had determined had been some of the mining areas of Lumpkin County for copper, we started finding some of these strange rocks that always seemed to appear in those areas. And we started doing some research on it. We came up and found out it was called Gossen. And this is just one big example. It's not around here, obviously, but it's some really good photographs of what Gossen uh, kind of looks like. It's a kind of a rusty, weathered looking rock. Um, Gossen or German for Eisenhut is intensely oxidized, weathered or decomposed rock. Usually it's the upper or exposed part of an ore deposit or mineral vein. So if you were a miner or a prospector in the 19th and early 20th century, Gossens were clues because they were on the surface as guides to ore deposits or buried treasure, essentially, used by the prospectors in their quest for metal ores. And the thing was, is that if you would find these on the surface, especially in larger amounts, the larger the amount would indicate that there's a good chance that below that, there's probably some type of metal precious metal, silver, gold, copper, something like that, that's underneath that. And this is kind of an illustration of how it would work, that over time, Gossen becomes the weathered rocks and every all the mineralization and everything like that it essentially gets washed down lower and lower and lower until you get to the very bottom where you see the primary mineralization protor down here. And I don't know what all the different uh, chemical compounds mean. Manny might know. <laughs> Well, these, these are other examples around the world of copper uh, gossen outcrops in different places. Primarily down in South America, there's a lot of copper mining there. So you will find a lot of these up in the mountains uh, where there's indications that there's uh, copper below these gossen deposits here. And you see copper mineralization. Sometimes it might even have slight traces of copper. And if you know copper, when it oxidizes, it has that kind of distinctive green color to it. You might see traces or streaks in some of the Gossen rocks. In fact, some of the ones that we had out in the county, when Manny and I a couple of years ago had been going out to some of these locations looking for this, we did find some of these Gossen rocks with very small indications of uh, oxidized copper embedded in the Gossen rocks. Um, so how is copper mined, extracted and processed? And how do these methods differ from gold mining? And I thought this was a question I didn't ask in my original program, but I thought it was interesting to ask today because if you were gold mining, how would you be able to transfer or extract the copper? Was it similar or was there a difference right there? And the thing that was different was that in copper mining, there was two basic uh, styles or types of mining that they would use. The first one was called open pit mining which was a technique to extract copper that was on or near the surface. So if you find these Gossen rocks and you start pulling them away and start digging down, you might start finding in indications of copper, then you can start doing just open pit mining. This is what you see today on a larger scale where they will take huge swaths of earth and just start making terraces going lower and lower to dig the minerals out of the ground. That's a good example of open pit mining. In our case, obviously it wouldn't have been that large. The second one, is underground mining when the copper ore is not located or near the earth's surface. And so you either have to go on the side of a hill or a ridge and so forth, or dig straight down digging shafts in order to try to locate and follow um, that vein of copper, similar to gold mining in a lot of ways in, in both these cases. Um, the difference now is that once you would get the copper, how do you extract it? 
Sometimes if you had big paying pieces of copper, it would be easy to extract that by using nothing more maybe a hammer and a chisel in order to break it away from the uh, non copper bearing type rocks and then you know collect it like so. Or in many of the cases, you're finding that the rocks are, are, that are embedded that have the copper need to be pulverized. Now they did use um, stamp mills similar to what we actually had used for gold mining. So the gold mining stamp mill could have been utilized also uh, for copper mining. That's where it kind of stops. From there, there's a chemical process in order to extract the copper that would require them to have this ore bundled up in big barrels and sent someplace, maybe as far as Ducktown, Tennessee, in order to process this. Why? Because the chemical process to extract copper is different than what it is for the gold. And so they didn't have that here. And so I think ultimately this is gonna be why we see the copper industry, it never really took off because they didn't have transportation as well as the uh, refining methods for that here. And so the, uh, the process or the cost was more than it was for to be gained from the uh, end result of copper. In 1850, this map of the United States at that time shows by the little red dots here in the states where copper had been found throughout the country at this time. And as you can see, it's kind of sparse. There wasn't a lot of copper mining that had taken place throughout the United States yet. Um, many people, if you're familiar with copper, may be familiar with the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, up along the Keweenaw area. And that was a big area, still is, uh, for copper mining. There was a lot of copper that was being mined from that area. The thing that made it interesting was that it was right on the shores of Lake Superior, so you had no shortage of transportation by use of boats to transport that to other locations if you needed it to be smelted or refined. But in this case, they were able to do that right there. They have a lot of huge mining operations that were going on up there. Obviously around Pennsylvania, New York, and the other areas around the colonies, North Carolina, South Carolina, and into Tennessee, they had found um, other different deposits of copper here. But in Georgia, no. And it's interesting because if you notice, it looks like it kind of follows similar to the gold uh, belt that we have down here in Georgia. It runs kind of southeast to northwest where these copper locations have been discovered here. So it was just probably a matter of time in Georgia that someone would eventually discover copper in this area. This was a map that came out of the uh, survey for Georgia from 1919. And it shows the map of the pyrite deposits. Now pyrite and copper typically are found closer, you know, within the same place of each other. And if you see here is Lumpkin County, and you'll notice that this pyrite or copper belt seems to run through White into Lumpkin Dawson, heading down towards kind of Peters out down here in Cherokee County. Doesn't seem to indicate too much after that. So this was already a time, 1919, when all this had been discovered. What's coincidental, or maybe not, is that it pretty much follows also, your Lumpkin County, the Gold Belt through Georgia. They all run northeast to southwest, you know, in these streaks throughout the state as far as the gold does. And we go back to the copper, it's pretty much the same direction right there. So we're seeing that within Lumpkin County, it's no coincidence that the gold and the copper belts in some cases just overlap because they're both running the same direction right there. And so um, Jack had asked a question earlier at one point was when we were looking at some of these old mining holes, how do we know that they weren't for gold mining and that they were for copper? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to it here, because that, that was a good question. Copper mining locations in Lumpkin County, this kind of gives you an idea from an older map from the 1840s where they had found copper uh, up to the late, early 1900s within the county. Some down by the south of our area, just a couple of them. Most of them were clustered around the Long Branch area and then some out as far as uh, the Fannin, Union County, Lumpkin County, uh, state uh, county line out there. Here's just the breakdown of some of the names of where they were located at and what, what district they were located in and the years that they were prospected. 
This was the first mention that I had found of copper mining in the newspaper in Lumpkin County. This was re reported in one of the other state newspapers, so it might have actually been earlier reported here in Lumpkin, but we don't have newspapers on microfilm from that time period in that decade that we found yet. So it's actually good that we do have some, but uh, it just talks about the discoveries and they always talk in these grandiose terms that the copper mines seem to have all the indications of being just as good as the Ducktown mines up in Dennis, Tennessee. And we see this repeated there. They always got these great visions of grandeur for Lumpkin County. Now, what's strange is that this was from August of 1853. Our next mention doesn't come until about April 12th, 1854. So about another nine, nine months or so, or eight months until we see something. So I don't know if they just hadn't found anything or if they were just doing some more prospecting or what was going on. But now we start seeing gold and copper mines in Lumpkin that they're talking about this. And this is just coming from other news reporters who have been going, traveling to the north part of the state there to report what was going on with different things. So everybody knew about the gold in Lumpkin County, obviously, but then they go on to start talking about copper mining. And we get down here, it says in relation to the copper mine region, the Mooresville, the Mooresville copper mine. I don't know if that re referred to the area that was up where the copper mine or the pyrite mine is located at now, but it was named after Mr. Moore, who was one of the owners of the area. So they called it the Mooresville copper mine. Some seven miles northeast from Dahlonega is evidently one of the most promising or is one of the most promising character. This vein, which is finally developed, has within the past two weeks been principally leased and bought up by Mr. Maurer Stevenson and Company. I think it's supposed to be more Stevenson and Company and are now making preparations to get out the ore on a large scale. Lumpkin County will stand among the first in point of mineral wealth. That was from a traveler's observation. Now we get into May of 1854, so about a month after that last report was mentioned. Tests for copper are exceedingly flattering, presenting indications as far as they have progressed equal, if not to superior to the Ducktown mines once again. There remains no longer doubt as to the lead of copper passing through Lumpkin County. So you get the impression that they are finding that this is not just one isolated location, that it's, there's an actual lead or that it, it falls within a certain uh, direction and area of the county here. May into June of 1854, we start getting more descriptions of these two mines. And we see two different mining companies here. One talks about Moore Stevenson and Company, and the other one talks about Welchel and Company, or, or a Welchel and Stevens, not Stevenson. So there's two se separate and distinct mining companies that are kind of competing against each other. And it goes on to say about, in this case, 18 feet of a tunnel upon a vein, and from every appearance bids fair to have to be of great width as the ore bank or vein or bank or vein seem quite firm. And they talk about the color of it. The ore when first struck was what is termed gray oxide. It is now assumed a darker shade and is very rich, pronounced by those familiar with copper ore to be worth 40 to 50 percent. So if I'm understanding that as a layman would, that out of this ore they're getting, it's only about half of it is only bearing copper out of it there. So that's a lot of work. So if you're taking 50% of the rock, you got to break down the other 50% to try to get some type of paying, you know, out of this right there. So it sounds like a lot of work. You're not getting a lot of return for it. So October of 1854 goes on to talk about more about um, the mine, but a large vein of first-class copper ore within six miles of Dahlonega, but it's so situated as to cost a great expenditure of money to secure it, that a shaft was sunk, but water and gas poured into it with such torrents as to render further efforts useless without a tunnel of considerable length. A narrow vein has also been discovered within two miles of Dahlonega, which is not likely to prove remunerative. Our correspondent states fair among the mountains was quite rough except in the villages where it was usually very good. 
But you know, it was interesting because this was about the last mention of copper mining, essentially, that was mentioned in any of these newspapers in Lumpkin County. You know, I've searched all the other online newspapers where I'd found these other indications right there and tried different search phrases, um, but haven't found anything really after 1854. So it's like with the gold rush, it kind of, as soon as it was started, it was almost over. So within almost a year or so, it seems like things kind of petered out. Either they didn't find any more, or in the case of this uh, article, that uh, the water and gas got into the mine and they weren't able to pump it out. So they basically might have just had to abandon it. This was a map of landlot 109 that was known as the Bowley Fields Copper Mines. I think most people have heard of the, heard of the Bowley Field Gold Mine, which is in a completely different location on the Chesapeake River, which is over by where the old uh, Ore House restaurant used to be at by the 52 Bridge. That's where the gold mine was at. Now this Bowley Fields Copper Mines, you'll notice again, the direction follows along what is today Long Branch Road. This where it says Dahlonega Road that crosses it. This is basically the location right here on highway was at 52 that runs heading towards Cleveland. And then the um, Long Branch Elementary School would be approximately right here today near this crossroads. So the roads themselves have just been improved over time. They really haven't changed as far as direction. But what the interesting thing is that the copper leads that were discovered pretty much ran just on the one side of the road on the northern side of the road here or the western side and followed it all the way back down towards where the Home Depot would be today for, for the most part. It didn't cross the road, maybe because there's the ridge line there and that's the higher ground. So over time, that's where these ore bodies were located at. And this over time, uh, over the tens of thousands or millions of years as the mountains have worn down, that it's exposed uh, these copper mines or these copper locations that they have located right there. This is a blow up of that. Landlot 101, which is right here. This is where the copper or pyrite mine is located at today that everyone's familiar about. And then Landlot 100, 109 and 110. This whole area right here, again, was when we started investigating this, when Manny and I had gone out a couple of times, we started finding definite indications of copper mines uh, in this whole area, some within the subdivisions that people just didn't even know what they were. They were just holes in the ground that had been covered up or grown over with trees and so forth. This was an 1856 map of the Chestity copper mines. And as you can see where it says the falls as a point of reference, this would have been where the pyrite mine is located at on this big bend in the river up there today. And then as we see again, copper lead, it follows basically the same direction as Long Branch Road goes today. So it basically follows that whole lead. And then here again, the Dahlonega Road that crosses, this is where the Long Branch Elementary School is located at today as a, as a point of reference there. So it's all been, nothing would be the same as we're looking at this uh, in hindsight, looking back to 1856, because it's all been incorporated with new roads and subdivisions and houses and so forth right there. This was a cross section of the Chesapeake Copper Mine on lot 109. And as you can see, this was pretty extensive. Um, I think that this was the same year, 1856. So as you can see, there was one large vertical shaft and then there was a second one over here. And then they had other ones. Maybe this was the one they had talked about that had flooded. And then on the top, you would have had your uh, whim or your cable with your um, spindle on it in order to lower the ore buckets down or maybe even people. And then what's interesting is you notice that here's Gossen. So this is all your Gossen deposits on the top. And then the copper ore lies very deep below that right there. So as you can see, they would have had to have gone through a lot of this Gossen to dig that out in order to actually get down to where the load or the copper bearing ore was located at. So they would have had to go down pretty deep to, uh, to do that. And uh, I don't think it has me a point of reference on here to show how deep this was. It looks like it's from this the surface to this first added, it looks like it says 45 feet right there, but it doesn't say the additional. I'm guessing maybe if you want to double that, maybe about another 90 to 100 feet total surface down to the lower level of this shaft right here. And this one says it looks like 86 
from the surface down to the bottom there. So pretty deep, pretty deep. These were some examples of copper mining companies that were started in not just Lumpkin, but also Dawson County from between 1855, 58, and 61. And you notice that this one had the main office in Dahlonega. This one was in numerous counties, but their home office was Dawson County. And this one was in Dahlonega also. President J.J. Field, presidents was uh, Ezekiel Spriggs, Zion Spriggs, and John Summermore. And down here you got William Ruthford and James Payton were the uh, mine owners for the presidents. Now, what we're for more familiar with was the pyrite mine, which used to be called the copper mine. It wasn't until 1895 when it was actually purchased after a long period of inactivity that it was purchased and pyrite was discovered in 1895. And then later it was developed and exploited for the pyrites that were in there. Um, so this was slightly different, obviously, than copper. Yes, copper had been discovered there initially, but it had kind of played out. And so it wasn't until after this long period of time that it was purchased and pyrites were being mined there, mainly initially for fertilizer. But when they built this that you're seeing on the screen with the processing mill and the small spur line railroad, this was the war effort during World War I because pyrite was being used in the production of high explosives uh, for the war effort. And so it became a national strategic priority uh, to mine the pyrites. And these are some other photographs of uh, the pyrite mine when it was in operation. And then you got an underground uh, drill in order to drill holes in order for dynamite or to break that rock loose. It doesn't look like that today either. It's all been pretty much all shut up and torn apart. Remains of copper mining today. This was Manny uh, and uh, one of the members of Bragg. Who was that, Russ? Russell, Manny? That went that was Russ, yeah. 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 We had gone out. This was off of um, Winding Stair Gap Road, way up on the county line with, I believe it was Fannin County. It was way up there. And the reason that we had gone up there, this was in December 12th of 2015, and we're still wearing short sleeve shirts. <laughs> The reason we had gone up there was I had gotten that survey of pyrite and copper deposits in Lumpkin County. And this was one of the areas that it said when this land lot, they had discovered copper. And so we had gone up there just to go check it out and see. And we walked around and walked around and never did find anything until finally we finally moved down about another hundred yards into the woods um, and found what looked like some traces or e evidence of some type of shafts that had been covered up. And as we kept poking around the area, we started seeing what Manny's holding was, you know, evidence of this goss and rocks. At that time, we didn't know what they were, but they were definitely unusual and they, they hadn't been placed there. They were like dug up out of these pits. So we knew somebody had some kind of man-made activity that was going there. So we thought we must be in the right area, at least. This is how the maps would compare from the 1850s to today on where the copper mining locations would have been at these prospects. This was a blow up of the map. As you can see, here's Long Branch Road. And this is a map of today on where the different roads are and the subdivisions. The little green boxes that I indicated here are the places that uh, we had gone out to and investigated and found evidence that mining or at least mining prospecting had been going on and there were still some gossens out in this area today we were literally walking around some of these people's backyards looking at these strange holes in the ground this was one that we found and where this photograph was taken i was standing on the road looking down the hill and manny was checking out this pit that was kind of overgrown down there and it, it, it actually isn't that deep it just kind of looks like that from the photograph but this was obviously what we had talked about earlier, one of the open pit mines that they had been finding some surface rocks. And the sad thing is that we can't see in hindsight what the miners would have saw because all that has been removed. So it's, it's easy to speculate, well, maybe there were some big gossen and rocks on the surface right there, which were their indicators. And that's what they went for. And they started digging down around that. And maybe they were getting some indications of copper. So they kept on digging. And then eventually 
it just kind of uh, didn't pan out for them, so they moved on to someplace else. But this wasn't the only hole that we located in this particular little subdivision area here. Here was another one where Manny was down at the bottom checking it out, but we didn't find anything. And then it's kind of hard to see, but where these trees had grown up at over the years, you can kind of see how it runs like almost like a trench in a way, this kind of a low ground that runs down here below this tree. So this was another not man-made that somebody had intentionally dug this out at some point uh, in years past. This was very fascinating because this was very, um, this was a man-made canal that has just been overgrown over all the years. And it was interesting because I knew this had to do something with mining, be it copper or gold mining, because just a little further down, you'll notice there was this rock man-made wall that has been had these trees and stuff grown up and you wouldn't even really notice it or give it a second glance unless you saw that there were these rocks that were stacked there intentionally and all moss covered and so forth. But this was located just a little bit further down here from where this little canal was at. So this was able to, for whatever reason they're using it for, water power to harness it or whatever, but it was to channel this water apparently into this one area. Maybe this is what they were using in order to help um, wash the rocks in order to separate the copper from the, uh, from the overburden essentially. Now, what came next was really scary because this was in a separate location as we kept going down and we found this almost 100 foot straight down shaft that was literally in this subdivision. There's no fence and nothing around it. Just trees have grown over it and you can walk right on it until you're right there and not see this hole right there. So I was very concerned that somebody would eventually fall down this thing and probably get killed because it's so deep. But you can see as looking down there that somebody had dug this straight down, obviously, and you can see where the rocks, where minerals were at along the sides as they were going deeper. So I'm of the opinion that maybe they were finding good indications of copper, which led them to keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until they just didn't find anything else anymore. And these are just some other photographs that we found around this area, uh, more of the rock wall, another one of those pits that Manny had found. And this one, uh, which was really interesting, um, it's like a big holding tank made of concrete. This is 20th century, and it was just literally above the pyrite mine. And then there was also like a fire hydrant or a water release uh, further downhill from this which was probably had something to do to releasing water in case there was a fire or something in the mine below that they could pump the water down or maybe it was for hydraulic mining of some sorts because we did find some type of a uh, riveted pipe um, further down through the woods here, which made it interesting because it was really hard to get through and it had just been overgrown. So you kind of imagine, this thing was probably about 60 feet in, in, in wide and it was all perfectly made of concrete. So it was just a big holding tank of some sort that had just been overgrown. Lastly, we had checked out some additional prospects going down Long Branch Road and where these little green arrows were located at. This was just south of uh, the Long Branch Elementary School. So we kind of trotted out into the woods one day and got to the top of the ridge line and kind of started going downhill. And then we ran across some other holes that were down there. And these were kind of dug into the side. And these, you know, they could be mistaken like we talked about with Jack had asked if these were mines uh, or for copper or for gold. And, you know, it could go either way, I guess. But since copper mining was taking place in this specific area that we know of, and not so much gold mining, it's probably leads to believe that some type of copper adits or uh, prospecting uh, holes that they were finding some kind of surface indications and just kind of like poking around and digging this out to look to see if there's anything deeper. It didn't look like it went any deeper. It was kind of filled in with a lot of trash and uh, leaves and surface debris. Manny tried to get in there and clean it out a little bit there and didn't find anything. Uh, I had my metal detector and found an old wagon hook uh, at the end of this little trench right there that had been born there is cast iron, nothing fancy. This was kind of a larger view. And this was the top of the ridge line. So you can see how somebody was kind of like digging uphill, looking for something here at some point. But these were all in close proximity. There was three or four within about a 50 yard radius of each other next to Long Branch Road up into the woods here. And here's another one that was kind of like falling in, not very deep either. 
And this kind of gives you a little bit more perspective as far as where this was located at that it was filled in with a small shaft entrance right there. So I think you can see there was good evidence that at some point in time, copper mining was kind of hot, you know, even if it was a short period of time in the county and these guys were really eager to get to it, but apparently it just didn't pay off in large quantities for it to be a uh, productive uh, long-term industry. So that's all I have. I hope everybody enjoyed that. And at this time, I'll take anyone's questions. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, okay, I, I, I believe you can all unmute yourself right now if you want to, if you have a question. There are no written questions, Chris. Uh, Chris, this is Robin Hall. Um, very, it's very interesting. Um, as you, you may know, I, in an earlier life, I was a copper miner um, and studied mining engineering worked. The use of Gossen as a prospecting tool is, is interesting because old prospectors also used to use the vegetation around the copper Gossen as a, as a marker because particular plants seem to thrive on the copper content um, which, which is an, was an interesting thing and it showed that prospectors didn't even have to dig a hole in order to get some idea of what might be underneath. Um, I was interested in, in what you're saying about uh, why did the copper mines never really take off and, and the difficulty in transporting whatever was taken out. Um, about the same time as, as, this as these mines were being attempted to open up, the largest copper mining area in the world was actually in Cornwall in England. Um, and it was successful both because it had a lot of copper there, but also because there was sea transport available, which took the copper ore after it had been sorted rather than processed to get to try and increase the copper content um, to South Wales, where putting together the copper ore and coal from that area made smelting of copper the, a, a massive business. And in fact, export of, of copper from Wales at that stage was the largest source of copper in the world. Um, I can see that somebody with a small artisan pit in North Georgia and having to send their ore all the way to Tennessee by wagon didn't have a chance <laughs> financially, which uh, led me to, on to think that some of the newspaper reports you so interestingly showed might have been people who had a vested interest in um, whipping up the uh, prospects in order to find um, gullible investors. Any thoughts on that? Chris, you're muted. Chris, you're not mute, you're muted. Unmute yourself. Okay, there you go. Can you hear me? Okay. I think that's very possible. I mean, we see that with uh, the uh, gold mining a lot, especially around the time when the uh, consolidated gold mine was going on. There was so much uh, hullabaloo about how this was going to be so great combining all these different mining operations under one umbrella that uh, they were trying to attract more and more investors. And uh, especially moving into the 20th century, we know the people like Graham Dugas, who was well known as a uh, mining entrepreneur and a very self-important salesman there to try to get more uh, prospective buyers to come down here. Uh, he, he was a showman. And that's one of the things that you really need when it comes to mining is someone who's got that ability to attract outside sources and capital to come and finance your operations. I think you're, you're, that, that you're dead on though. I, I would not mm -hmm. doubt that other state newspapers would want to try to tout you know, the possibility that Georgia had so much uh, potential for uh, investment here. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you mentioned Cornwall because I know that uh, when I mentioned earlier Lake Superior, many of the miners that had emigrated to that area came from Cornwall. Uh, and a lot of the people that still live up there are the descendants of Cornish miners. 
Um, in fact, one of the things that's interesting is um, pasties or pasties. It's a famous dish that was served by uh, Corn Cornish miners that the wives would make it basically like a hot pocket, something that they could take with them down into the mines and heat up over their lamps, uh, just a meat filled pie, basically something small they could fit with them to take with them. And I guess that's a um, traditional favorite from Cornwall is uh, pasties. Oh, absolutely so. Um, they used to say that you could go to any mine in the world and shout Jack at the shaft head and a Cornishman would come up. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions, comments? Chris, this is Leonard Gay. Yes, sir. Um, I, it sounded like the uh, copper ore is in veins. Can you tell me what the parent rock is? No, that was the, the difficult part because it didn't, in these newspaper articles, really get into discussion about that. And so it was really hard to try to figure out what we'd be looking for. If I wanted to look for any type of evidence of copper today, what rock was it embedded in? Um, I would have to think it was similar to the gold, not necessarily quartz, but some of the other common gneiss or hornblende rocks. Sure. Areas. Thank you. You're welcome. Unmute yourself, Jack. All right. Well, Jack. Jack has a question. You need to wait a minute. He has a question. Unmute yourself, Jack. Click on the little microphone. Okay. There you go. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> the the um, the state published a whole lot of technical reports during this late nineteen or late late eighteenth early nineteenth century, and probably still do. The, and there surely must be reports on the copper mines that describe those stones you're talking about. I just don't happen to know the name of one, but there are places to find that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The library has a, our, our library has a fairly decent uh, accounting of some of the uh, mineral uh, reports or different types of mineral reports on hand. If That'd not, be a place to start. Account. Right. And if not, then, you know, if someone had an interest in locating that, um, the library could probably get those through an interlibrary loan, which I had to, had to do on several occasions to get the original copies of some of those books there if they weren't available online. Leonard would probably give you more information than you ever wanted to know. I would say that it's not included on the presentation because I felt it was a little bit different because it had to deal with the uh, pyrite mine. But uh, I had gone out to the pyrite mine to look at where the railroad was at, since that was a separate topic. And especially now, since all the vegetation is uh, pretty much died off for the season, you can see a lot more. And there are still huge, huge boulders of Gossen around that area where the uh, processing plant was located uh, near the Chesity River out there. So those little small this size ones that Manny and I were, were locating was nothing compared to what they've got up there by the pyrite mine. So that's probably why that area was the ground zero of sorts where the copper was at. That was probably the biggest lead of copper for, probably for the county uh, at one point or another, or maybe just over different you know years as they were working that. But as they got to a point that they couldn't get down any lower because the water filled into the tunnels, they didn't have the technology or the money uh, to pump that out. That's probably why they gave up on it right there. Since most of these operations were small, as Robin pointed out, they couldn't compete with somebody larger until they brought in the money, had the resources to do that. Leonard, you have to unmute yourself. Leonard, unmute yourself. Okay, I was saying I'm a bit interested in the rocks in the area. And as far as I know, uh, they're, um, they're all very ancient, uh, metamorphic. Uh, I know the, the rocks exposures in my lawn are garnet schist. And um, 
you know, with lots of mica and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I don't know if the entire area is, is characteristic uh, of that, but it's interesting. Rick? Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank Chris? you. Chris? Go ahead, go ahead. Yep. Chris? Oh, the Principes. Yes. I just wanted to say that was very interesting. That's our neighborhood that you uh, did on that Riverview Trail. So it was kind of interesting to see that. And I thank you for sharing. You always do great talks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I hope that if you find any more interesting holes, be sure to take pictures of them because there were some other locations, I'm sure, uh, along well the area, too. along Long Branch, that there's probably a lot more that have not been documented. Maybe because people don't know what they are. They just have a hole in your yard. It's overgrown. It's like, oh, that's just some old hole. Or is this a, some, some old gold mining? When in fact, it might be actually more evidence of copper mining that uh, we hadn't previously known about. I'll have to go exploring. <laughs> Hey, Chris, uh, yes. I, we have a number of uh, small pits around the area here, some on our land and some just outside. They're not very deep. Mm -hmm. They're maybe four or five feet deep and maybe, uh, you know, six to 10 feet around, more or less oval. And do you think that that's just random or do you think that that might be evidence of some kind of mining? I think it might be evidence of some kind of mining because a lot of times it might look random but there might be like a method to the madness right there. So if they were like kind of like process of elimination, if you're digging in one spot and you have indications, you're gonna keep digging there. Or if you don't find something, you go someplace local, you know, next to it right there. It sounds like somebody's kind of hunting around if they're fairly close to each other. How deep do you think that they would go before they'd give up? I would probably guess probably not more than uh, what we saw in some of those other photographs right there, probably not more than maybe six to eight feet in some cases. Okay. Uh, my other question, not to hog all the time, but my other question is on our property itself too. We have a lot of white cords here and uh, they're all probably about grapefruit size and they're just kind of scattered randomly all around. I picked them up to make little borders and stuff. Why do you suppose the white quartz would be on the surface ch in chunks like that? It might have just been tailing piles from something, or um, it might have just been the location with a lot of from from a larger boulder that got broken up at some point there. Okay. It could be totally natural um, erosion over millennia. Uh, when we built our house up here in Porter Springs. Uh, we had a hell of a lot of grading done and it went down deep, deep, deep and there was clay and mixed up with the clay, which obviously had was um, not uh, anything that had been exposed to the air for possibly millions of years, who knows, um, were a lot of quartz, little quartz boulders, white quartz. Not, some of them weren't even stained by the clay that they were in and you know th those were 20 feet underground deep in in moraine now when you say uh a boulders how how big do you think that they were and were they more or less rounded or were they fractured um they tended to be smooth edged and i would say half the size of my head okay yes my, my property is basically the same experience when i built my house i live on halls mill road which is just a little bit away from Walmart. Um, um, I had quartz all over the place. We picked up a lot of a lot of them, just like you did, to use as borders. And they were basically, you know, six to eight inches rounded, uh, with little fractures on it, but but rounded. Um, I, I think that's natural. I think Robin is right. Ra national uh, natural erosion processes as the mountains wore away. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, none of ours have uh, roundedness on them. They're all fragmented on all sides. They're more or less, and this is very roughly, more or less uh, squ square blocks, but, but very crude square blocks. I just wanted to echo that too. On our property, we have uh, 18 acres. We're just uh, on the right, at, right below uh, 60 and uh, where 400 starts, like three miles from 400. And our, our 18 acres we have, is, it's covered in a quart size, you know, about that same similar size. Yeah. 
and some of them bigger, some just exposed in the surface. And of course, when we graded and everything and cleared uh, for two houses there, um, we found, you know, all kinds of chunks of quartz. So it's, it's very prevalent. Mm -hmm. Well, your, your, your property and mine are both in the gold belt. So that's the, the kind of indication that. Right. We actually have a, a, apparently a gold mine on our property. It was a, one of the, it was a Smith mine which I haven't done any more further investigation, but I know where it's at. And it's listed in the, uh, in the, uh, the tax records as a gold mine. They had cut it off from the rest of everybody else's property, uh, but it's, it's part of ours now. And it's really interesting what it is back there though. It uh, apparently was not a shaft mine, but they had built a huge dam. There's all kinds of boulders like a, that a man could be able to pick up a big man <laughs> anyway and and uh you know block the creek and it then it goes downhill which then goes right into the chestity because we're near the chestity i i yeah. have um gold mines on my property here and but you're asking about the test the, i have test pits dug and they are i'd say they're six to eight maybe nine ten feet deep um and they dug the test pits, but they found if the test pits proved out that they had the right kind of ore, then they would dig the mines. And I've we've got three we've got three mines here. I've been in one of them, um, but it's uh, and I too have a lot of those white quartz rocks all over the property. I've got 17 acres, and uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of them. Right. But uh, the test pits, I've got four big test pits on the property, and um, you know. The, and the test pits are relatively close to where the mines are. There are some, I, which I'm assuming is also test pits like that, but not right uh, in pro close proximity of where the gold mine was. But they're they're probably about eight or ten feet across, and maybe four or five feet deep. And they're very—I mean, it's just very unusual. Obviously, they're man-made because uh, you know trying to determine whether it was natural, and they certainly don't look natural. No, the, the, the test pits on my property, it's very obvious that they are uh -huh. actually being made test pits. Yeah, there's no shortage of quartz and mining prospects throughout the county. You know, and I've been to a lot of these unused ones out there. And it's interesting, not just the location of the quartz, but the amount and different shades of it there. Some of it's really pretty. You find some locations where there's a large amount of a greenish colored quartz and you go to another one, it's got it's kind of a rose or even some kind of cases of purple uh, tint to some of the quartz around here. And that's just happens to be in that one small location right there. So it's uh, it's always fun to try to find the different kind of rocks that they have around here. Right. I've always been attracted to rocks. I started collecting rocks from everywhere I ever went as a child. I always <laughs> took brought home a rock so I'm not quite sure what that says about me, but <laughs> you, you you missed out you missed out on the uh, uh, archaeology club talk last night. The young I was lady there. who was I, was, speaker, I was there last night. She started off the same way you did. Yeah, and my I'm David Martin. I can't figure out how to get my last name up there on the uh, uh, where on my little picture or whatever. Uh huh. But anyway. I think I can I'm not trying to you. hide my last name. <laughs> you want me to fix it? You want yeah. M A R T A N? Yes. Yes, sir. T I N? T I N. Uh huh. There you go. Oh, there we go. Well, that was easy enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I, if I can say one other thing about, about the, the big difference between copper mining and gold mining that, was, that probably had an impact here. Uh, copper, unlike gold, is not. Uh, is not something that will remain in a metal form. It it reacts fairly fast in in geological terms, um, as compared to gold, which is extremely stable. And so you get a lot of interesting minerals. Um, I'm just holding up here. I don't know how the colours come across. That's a piece of malachite, which is a copper copper sulfate, copper carbonate blend, um, and uses the gemstone. Um, but if, if there were gold miners here who thought that they were going to get into copper mining and it would be the same, they were in for a, a big disappointment. 
because what comes out of the ground is not pieces of copper. It come, what comes out of the ground is as that um, diagram that, that we saw earlier from Chris showing the different sort of minerals at different levels. That's what happens. And um, it's, keep, that's the one down, down the, uh, right, keep going. Um, it's, it's the one showing the, um, the, min, the names of the minerals down the, that's it. Yep. That's it. That was it. Go back. Go back. One more. This one. That's that the one. one. That one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. If you have a look down there, you see that on the right hand side the names of all the sort of things that you will find um, in a traditional uh, copper um, copper vein, um, which traditionally is traditionally I'm not sure that's the right word is is um, something that is coming up uh, from as as molten rock. And the, the actual vein acts as a as both a an oxidizing zone and also as a distilling column. So you find the copper is mixed in at the top at the top end, and then as you go further down, you'll end up in 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 tin and silver and gold, even deeper. But Round here, most of the most of the gold mines are, in fact, not these veins, but are based on um, gold that has been washed into the rivers through oxidation of, of the material around it. Um, and so, if you were going to go copper mining here, there's no point in getting in the river with a pan and hoping that you're going to find lots of lumps of copper because you're not. That co any copper that comes out in, in native copper form at the top of the oxide zone will, over a period of just a couple of years, start to decay and turn in, into green stuff. Um, and like, like the malachite I showed you, which is the next one down. But interestingly, the last mineral that's mentioned at the bottom of that stack, um, calcopyrite, um, is has a much better, as a much more widely known, not by its, its its technical name, but that is what fool's gold is. So I, I, there's some sort of message there mm -hmm. uh, for for gold miners in in the in Delonica. Fool's gold is is um, really copper. That's right. Thank you, Robin. That was very interesting. I'll have to bring you around for our uh, special expert analysis next time. <laughs> mining, I know, uh, I used to know a lot about, but that's modern mining, but I've also taken an interest in the history. Very good. I'd like to thank everybody for coming to our program tonight. Um, we will have our next one on February the 11th, and we still haven't come up with the actual program itself, but the date will not change. It will be Thursday, February 11th, and so uh, just stay tuned. You'll get something either in the mail or online.